Louis Scarpin and Suzanne Sabiot. Uh, Sabiot used to be long ago the, the PhD student of Dominique. Um, they developed MAD in France. Um, and then they, for the first uh, couple of years, they wrote only in French. And then at a certain moment, they published in English, and everybody was calling each other. Did you read it? And then they, they gave a very well developed task model, a task modeling approach, a whole set of concepts, a theory, techniques to do it. And it's all only about task model one. They describe an existing task situation full stop, which is very useful. But it's only the very first step in redesign, right? So as long as you are aware that you, you learn a lot and it stops at a certain moment. And by the way, now they, they develop another technique. But this is not. So they speak about <coughs> tasks and goals of people, yeah. They speak about functions of the system, that's a, that's, these are delegated subtasks. Tasks are in hierarchies and you have subtasks and elementary tasks. Tasks could be in parallel or alternative. This is wrong, could be in a loop, could be a condition, could be optional. So they, they very carefully describe the relation between tasks and subtasks. Um, each task has an initial state and a final state. An initial state meaning you can only start performing the task if. And most of the time the if is to do with objects. If this object is available. If the zip code is filled in, right? So there's a condition to, for it to start it, and there's a final condition that says you can stop if, right? So th they, they really do have a nice way to say the goal is to go from this state to that state. So if you are not in this state, you cannot start. If you are here, you are finished if you reach that state. So there's prior conditions and post conditions, and there's a hierarchical tree of tasks and goals. And by the way, they in a way don't bother about the difference between task and goals. This is the same thing. So they are, in some cases, very precise, and in other cases, kind of careless, right? So as long as you are aware, this is nice. They have a way to ask the experts. It's still analytic method. It's knowledge that the experts can speak about. Now, this is how Suzanne Sepiot works um, in order to find task knowledge. And, 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 and this, this technique really works as long as you dare to keep your mouth shut. So you go to the expert. Suppose the expert is the librarian. And, and you go to the expert and you ask her. I will just take the person. So you go to the librarian and, and you ask her, I would like to know how you are able to, to help scientists that are writing a journal paper. Please explain me as completely and detailed as possible how you help scientists preparing a journal paper. And then you smile and you nod and you keep your mouth shut. For as long as the person is still making noise. So you are asking for a brain dump. And don't interrupt the brain dump. And this is difficult. For my students, it's all the time very difficult to not ask and to not show that you understand. Just smile and okay, you're doing fine. Continue. Mm -hmm. So you can say, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you need somebody to make notes. It's clear. Right. So, so dare to keep your mouth shut. That's the trick. And if you do that, you find out you need somebody to keep notes. You find out that people say, I do A because of B. If I say I do A because of B, then A is a lower level task and B is a higher level task for both. <coughs> right? um, or they say I want X and therefore Y. So I want X and therefore I do Y. Y means it's a lower level task or activity and X is a higher level task for both. Right? So you will find that naturally people are structuring their activities in a hierarchy. Don't interrupt. Now, at a certain moment, people really stop. And, and if, it's, if, if you cannot no longer wait, that then you could, based on your notes, um, so if you, you need somebody to keep, to keep notes, you could fill the gaps. How do you reach A? And how do you reach A? Ask for lower level activities, B, right? 
and you could ask why do you perform X and why do you perform X ask for a higher level task or goal X and, and this way you, you develop a higher level once again, it's so simple, it fits the back of an envelope, and it's so difficult because we don't want to keep our mouth shut, and we want to show that we understand. And as soon as you react, then, then the person will just uh, ask me, I, I will say yes or no, and the brain then stops. Right. It's so easy and so difficult. And you will find out there are levels, and, and, and uh, Sebillot tells me, the abstract, the highest level is the abstract formulation. Helping scientists who are writing the journal paper. Right? So this is the top. And, and then we get specific complex subtasks, which, which means that she says something like, uh, 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 "Open the digital library of IEEE and mm -hmm. right." And we say, mm, "This is expert language. I don't understand." Don't ask. Just write down and add note and smart. And then you get at the lower level domain independent procedure, like store a copy, send a message. Now I can understand it, yet, right? And then at the end you get elementary actions, ask for signature. And, 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 and these, these are the actions, the atoms, that is, the person you are interviewing is not able or not willing to speak about it. Even if it might be complex. In the secretary office, asking for a signature could, could mean different things. It could mean you put something in the pigeonhole because you know the person will be there in the afternoon when you are not in. Or it could be you go to somebody's office and ask, or it could be the person is not there, but you go to a colleague and say, can you sign because he is not in? Or it could mean that you sign per order yourself. Right? So there is a lot to speak about, but the secretaries refuse to speak about it. They ask for a signature, full stop. Shut up. Right? So th this is their atomic concept. Even if, as experts, they know how to handle different situations. Right? So depending on the situations, they will interpret it in a different way. But in their own knowledge, it's just one activity, not to be split. Okay. Exercise. So this is one for the afternoon. And this is on, on explicit expert knowledge. So, um, hopefully you are in groups of three. Otherwise, you should combine. One of you should be a task as an expert on a personal hobby. If I would be on your group, you could ask me about playing amateur music in a... In a String quarter, right? This is my own. It's all. So, and, and then you have an interviewer who asks, tell me anything about, smile, smile, right? And, and a note taker. And, and, and then you try to build a hierarchy description of the activities in the hobby dog. Okay. And I really urge you to, to do this because you need to find out how difficult it is to keep notes, how difficult it is to not say anything, but just listen and keep the other talking, right? Okay, so. Understanding implicit expert knowledge. Well, implicit expert knowledge is knowledge the experts are obviously <coughs> using. The medical expert is able to look at a very complex traffic picture and make a diagnosis, saying, oh, I can see there's a tumor here, and, and it's spread out to this region, but not that region, and, and this is the state, and so on, right? So, so the experts are able to do, if you ask, how can you do it, I see it. So, so it cannot be verbalized. Uh, so, so what can you do? You, you can observe, and you, and you could, well, maybe put it on video. Registration means put it, and, and then you could try to interpret. And, and we call this hermeneutic interpretation. So hermeneutic interpretation, actually, it's not psychology is based on philosoph philosophy um, and, and, and in this interpretation if, if I translate it in let me say simple words I'm looking at this behavior that I observe or that I put on, on video and what would be my knowledge and mental process if, if I would show that behavior of this expert so if I would be in the skin of that person what would be going on here so, and this is tricky as a liability problem, because it looks like <coughs> you are here, in fact, collecting knowledge not in the head of the expert, but in the head of the observer. Right? So what, what you need to know is you need multiple interpreters and you need to train them, and it can be done. So this is a, a special technique, and I'm not telling you, you can learn this in, in one afternoon, but I'm telling you, 
if you train people in the right way, you can have the same level of reliability that psychologists have in personality measurements, like in, in extraversion scales and, and, and that type of scale. So it, it, you can have a, a, an acceptable level of reliability, of repeatability by another but observer, observe, but it takes time. Uh, but still, I have an exercise. Um, actually, you, you should, an expert on making a sandwich, peanut butter, take something, you are from different countries. Some of you are from a country where they have different sandwiches than any other do. Ask this person to prepare, <coughs> let's say, their favorite sandwich. You can do this at lunchtime. And you have two observers, and the two observers develop separate, complete, and detailed observation notes. Just observation notes, right? No interpretation, just observe what you see. And then compare notes. Just to show that observation itself could so easily be colored by the observer. Right? And it, it would only work if the, if, the two, if the two sets of notes would be identical, right? And if one person has notes and the other says, no, I didn't see that, you interpret it, then you have a problem with it. So I challenge you to, uh, to find somebody in your team to, uh, to prepare an interesting sandwich and then make observations. So this is for the lunch hour, right?